Thank you so much for joining us for worship this morning. As some of us gather together this morning from home to worship, and as worship groups two and three uh, gather here at the church in person to worship. Nonetheless, we come into the presence of our God to worship, and we come with this invitation from Jesus. He said, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So we come into the presence of God to rest and to worship and to lay down our, our burdens at the cross of Christ. As we do that, God greets us. Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue to worship this morning. Are you hurting, broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is coming. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is coming.
This morning, I want to invite you uh, to join me as we approach God's throne of grace uh, and as we confess our sins together. Uh, So I want to lead you in a prayer of confession, and uh, I'll leave space open for you to lift your prayers to God. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you uh, for being a God of love and grace. Uh, A God who loves us uh, despite uh, our sin. And there's so much of it in our lives. Uh, We thank you for being a God of grace. Uh, A God who has provided us with uh, a way to receive forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, you didn't have to send your Son for us, but you chose to out of your love and grace. And for that, we are grateful. This morning, Father, as we lift our prayers to you, we ask that you would hear our prayers. Father, as we lift our prayers to you this morning, we ask you to hear our prayers. In your name we pray. Amen. And as we lift our prayers of confession to our our God and our Father, we know that he does hear our prayers and he offers us assurance that we are forgiven of our sins. Here's what we read in Romans chapter 12. Paul encourages us with uh, these words. Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And then he continues on later in the chapter to say this, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor in the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Let's continue to worship our God together this morning. You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul bound to stand. You stood before my face.
this time I'd like to invite you to grab your Bibles and join me as we continue our series called We Will Overcome. And uh, we're looking at Peter's first letter. And uh, again, this morning we're in 1 Peter chapter 1, and we'll be reading from verses 13 through 25. Uh, As we prepare to hear from God's word, please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. And we ask this morning that as we read from your word, your Holy Spirit would be active in our hearts and our minds, and that you would continue to shape and form us as your disciples for your glory and the building of your kingdom. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25. Therefore, prepare prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written... Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. As I think about this text, I'm reminded of a song that Uh, was made popular by uh, a band by the name of Jars of Clay. Uh, This song is, They Will Know We Are Christians By Our Love. The premise of the song is, is rather simple. Your discipleship, your being a follower of Christ, will be clear to the people around you, especially the community around us as a church, because of your love. Love is the most defining characteristic of your discipleship. Here are some of the lyrics of that song. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity will one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love. Yeah, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Over the years, there have been some different versions of this song, but what hasn't changed about the lyrics is this chorus. That we are Christians will will be known by the fact that we love. Uh, If we look a little closer at the lyrics, there are, are three parts to this message. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. This is an important part, and it's important to our understanding uh, of what it means to be part of the church. The church is one body, united together by Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the most fundamental understanding of what the church is. We pray that our unity will one day be restored. 
The background for this statement is that the church has become divided. And it has. The church today is a divided church, but we long for the day when the church will be united together as one. When the kingdom of God comes in full. In John chapter 17, Jesus prayed this prayer that we as a church would be one. And so we join Jesus together in praying this prayer that we would be one. They will know we are Christians by our love. It is this one primary virtue that uniquely displays that we are followers of Christ. More than any other virtue, love is the defining characteristic of the church. Paul argues this in his letters, specifically in 1 Corinthians, as he reflects on spiritual gifts. Love is the most defining characteristic of followers of Christ, because it is the most defining characteristic of the gospel. There are two sides to this. We have received love. We've received God's unconditional love, and then therefore we extend that love to others. This is agape love. Unconditional love. Self-sacrificial love. That's the love that we seek to then extend to others. Now I advocate for love as the most defining characteristic of followers of Christ, not because of this song, but because of the gospel. In his first letter, Peter advocates for love as the most defining characteristic of the church. And and what he's going to show is how we grow in our capacity for love. Now, the first word that we read in our text is therefore, which is an important transitional word. The word therefore functions by providing us with an important connection with what Peter has already established in the first chapter. Now this is where we were last week. In the first part of the text from last week, Peter said three things about followers of Christ. He he said, you love him. You love him as Christ. You love Jesus. According to the gospel, we are loved by God and we extend that love to others. Our love for Jesus is our rightly valuing him and our rightly treasuring him. Peter also said, you believe in him. Belief, which includes faith, is defined as being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's what we saw in the book of Hebrews. Belief is is primary as a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is through our belief, through our faith, that we have access to life in Christ. And then Peter said, you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Uh, That joy, according to Peter, is in Christ and is rooted in our receiving life in Christ. After saying these three things about followers of Christ, Peter went on to further encourage us with the message of the gospel, pointing to our living hope, which is in Christ. He he pointed to the inheritance we receive because of Christ, which is eternal life. And that life has already been secured for us. Peter pointed to the way in which God is shielding us through his power until the kingdom comes. That brings us to verse 13, where Peter starts off by saying, therefore, which suggests that everything that's going to follow in this text is written in light of what's already been said. One of the features of our text this morning, verses 13 through 25, is that Peter uses an almost overwhelming amount of verbs. In verses 13 through 21, Peter uses 16 verbs. As verbs are action words, that tells us that there's a lot of action taking place in this text. 
However, I think what we'll see is that there are three primary verbs. These three primary verbs are are the central message of the text. And then the other 13 verbs help to explicate uh, the primary verbs. So let's look at verses 13 through 17 together. Again, Peter says, Therefore prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you in Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. Now there's a lot of detail that's packed into those verses, but our focus is on the the three primary verbs. Those verbs are, uh, in verse 13, hope fully. In verse 15, be holy. And then in verse 17, live in reverent fear. We'll look at each of those verbs more closely. So the first one in verse 13 is the the command to hope fully. The word fully is important in this context because it, it tells us something about the extent of our hope. For Peter, hope is everything. In verse 3, he's already mentioned our hope, which he's described as a living hope. Now he comes back to the theme of hope, and he commands us to hope fully, meaning hope with every part of who we are. We are, are people who are called to embody gospel hope. But notice the object of our hope here in verse 13. Our hope, according to Peter, is in the future grace that will be ours when Christ comes back, when the kingdom of God comes in full. If this, then, is the object of our hope, the the future grace we will receive, then that has some implications for the way that we live now. Here's one of those implications. Every day, is lived in light of eternity. Everything we do displays that our hope is in the grace of God that we will receive when Christ comes back. Of the three primary verbs that Peter gives in this text, I think this one is maybe the most important. The reason is that the other two commands are delivered in light of this command, to hope fully. In verse 15, Peter delivers the second command, which is, be holy. The first command was to hope fully, meaning that we live every day in light of eternity. Now Peter tells us how to live every day. Be holy. Holiness, in its simplest form, is being set apart. It's being distinct. When Peter commands us to be holy after he's already commanded us to hope fully, he means that we strive to live distinctly every day. What does that mean? Well, look at the basis of our holiness. Peter commands us by saying, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. The basis of our holiness is the holiness of God. This command comes from the book of Leviticus, specifically in chapter 11, verses 44 and 45. If we looked at these uh, texts comparatively, uh, they give the same command. Be holy because I am holy. Just as he who called you is holy, be holy. So we strive to be holy holy, to be distinct like God is holy, like God is distinct from anything else that he has made. 
if we hope fully in the grace that we will receive when the kingdom comes, then we spend our time now striving to reflect God and his holiness because he is holy. Which brings us to verse 17 and the third command, which is to live in reverent fear. This is uh, not the command to live in fear. That's not what Peter is commanding us. He doesn't want us to live in fear, but he wants us to live in reverent fear of God. When I think about this command, and when I think about what reverent fear means, I think about C.S. Lewis and his book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, In the book, two characters are having a conversation about Aslan, about the the lion who is sort of the the God figure in this story. And the conversation uh, is, it goes like this. Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel quite nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he's not safe but he's good. This is what comes to mind for me when I think about reverence for God. According to Peter, we live in reverent fear of God because when our lives come to an end, we will stand before God and we will be judged impartially. We will stand before a perfectly holy God who is a perfectly just judge and we'll give an account for our life. I think that this should stir up in us some reverent fear. There's a a healthy fear of this judgment because this fear tells us that we care and that we are concerned about our standing before God. So when we put these three commands together, We hope fully in the grace that will be ours when Christ returns and when the kingdom comes in full. In respond to that grace that will be ours, we strive to be holy because God is holy and we are God's representatives. And we know that all people will stand before God who will judge impartially, so we live in reverent fear of God. And this reverent fear is healthy and it is good. All of that said, Peter provides us with assurance that there is, in fact, nothing to fear. Yes, you will stand before God. Yes, you will have to give an account for your life. But if you're a person of faith, then know You do not have to be afraid to stand before God. Why? Because of what Peter says in verses 18 through 21. Peter says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, so your faith and hope are in God. Now focus on verses 18 Uh, In 19, for a moment, Peter points us to an important truth. You have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. His death and resurrection has fully paid for all your sins, so that when you stand before God, you stand before him as someone who has been redeemed. There's a, a wealth of Bible passages that assure us 
Not only that God forgives us of our sins, but that he remembers them no more. That means her sin is gone. It's paid for. One example of a Bible passage that reminds us of this is Hebrews 8 verse 12, which says, For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Then notice the conclusion in verse 21. Your faith and hope are in God. Again, we have a reference to hope, which I think continues to emerge as an important theme for Peter. Our faith is in God. So this truth then becomes a reality in our life. Our hope is in God. So that our daily living is transformed and guided and directed toward eternity. The gospel hope that we have in God provides us with daily life and with meaning and with focus. Now here's where we come full circle. Look at what Peter says in verses 22 and 23. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. It's love that is the most defining characteristic of those who follow Christ. Peter demonstrates this in the text as he argues that love is the final result, the expression of our hope, of our holiness, and of our reverent fear. The most tangible way that those commands are lived out is through our loving others. More than anything right now, the gospel will be shared effectively through us by the way that we love. The way that we love each other in community and the way we demonstrate love for those in the communities around us and in our city and in our valley. Friends in Christ, we are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, and we pray that our unity will one day be restored. And they'll know that we are Christians by our love. By our love. They'll know that we are Christians by our love. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you have shown us unconditional, self-sacrificial love. In your Son, Jesus Christ, he, he demonstrated perfect love for us by going to the cross so we could have life. And now, Lord, you have called us to be people who share that love. Equip us with your Holy Spirit so that as we interact with people in our community and here in our city, in our valley, people will know without a doubt that we are Christians because of the way that we love. Through our love, be glorified and build your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship God together.
this time I'd like to invite you to join me in prayer as we pray for our community. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we will exalt you, Lord, for you have lifted us up out of the depths. We call to you, and you have healed us. We will sing the praises of your name, because in you we feel secure. We will not be shaken. Heavenly Father, this morning we pray for our community. We give thanks and praise that we can be worshiping together, not only from home this morning, but also that some of us can be worshiping here in person. Father, we pray that you would bless our time of worship. We pray this morning for those who are receiving care in the hospital. We pray for those who are undergoing treatments, for those who are waiting for procedures and for surgeries, for those who are living in continued care. Father, we pray for those in our community with loved ones who are receiving care and undergoing medical treatments. We pray that you would be near to them. This morning we pray for those in our community, our family who are traveling, and who are spending time away on vacation with family. We pray that you would go with them and that you would keep them safe and in your care. 
Heavenly Father, we pray for our witness here in Duncan, here in the valley. Help us to be your representatives through the way that we love each other and the way that we love our community. And this morning we pray for our city. We pray for those who are under-resourced. Pray for those who are caught in the cycle of addiction. Father, we ask that you continue to work through the church and through agencies that seek to provide help and support. Uh, we thank you for our doctors and nurses. We ask that you bless them and the work that they do and keep them healthy at this time. We also thank you again for law enforcement officers and pray, Lord, that they would be positive influences and positive contributor, contributors to our community. And Father, we pray for the church in our city, that we might be one. And not only that, we pray for the, the church in our country. We pray for the church spread across the world, Lord, that we at this time would hold in front of the world gospel hope. And that we would embody that hope for the world to see. So that all might come to know the truth and the beauty of the gospel. Father, be glorified in this time of worship. Be glorified in us, in all that we do, in all that we say. May the words of our mouths and may the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, in whose name we pray. Amen. And as we bring this time of worship to a close, receive this blessing from our God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen.